drinken beneden, na te praten. En het boekhandel van Stockholm is ook weer aanwezig deze avond met een boekentafel beneden, waar Harry uh, ook nog even zal aanschuiven om wat boeken te signeren. Um, ik hou het heel kort. Ik wil je alleen nog even vragen om de telefoon op stil te zetten. Twitter en Facebook heel graag, maar wel zonder geluid. En dan wens ik u heel veel plezier deze avond. Everybody, we're going, of course, going to do this evening in English since uh, Harry is here all the way from London and he's going to talk with us uh, about his book. And uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce him to you. Harry uh, was uh, 23 when he went into the British Army and in 2007 he stayed six months in Iraq. And in 2009, uh, he was a captain in Afghanistan. Uh, he was supposed to be there for half a year, but after two months, he stepped on a bomb. And uh, that, uh, as you can imagine, was really quite a big thing to happen. Uh, the recovery took quite some years, and uh, after a while, Harry decided to go uh, write his story down which resulted in this wonderful book that's out in Dutch right now, but also recently came out in England. Um, Anatomy of a Soldier tells the story of a British soldier, Captain Tom Barnes, who is leading British troops in a war zone. And then of course, um, a similar catastrophe is happening. He steps on a bomb and that uh, changes his life forever. Um, what makes this uh, book really interesting of course is, uh, well, first of all, that it's based uh, partly on what truly happened to the author, but uh, this is something, of course, in fiction that actually quite happens a lot. Um, but what makes the story even more special, that um, it's actually told from the perspective of 45 narrators, among which, for example, an army booth, a drone, a bed, an orthopedic bone saw, an incubator, uh, a mirror, and even a fungal infection. <laughs> so um, many, many different perspectives. And um, I was really, really curious how you came up with that idea. Yeah. Um, so when I was, uh, I know, sorry. Um, <laughs> when I when I started to write about my experiences, I um, I didn't really want to. Every time I sort of started to say that I was, I, I was patrolling around Helmand, or I was in Afghanistan, I um, it sort of felt uh, I felt it was very felt very odd to me. I didn't like doing it. There was something about putting myself out there in that way that felt wrong. And so I started to write more fiction, um, and I started to write a book from the point of view of some dogs, um, which wasn't very good at all. Um, but I started to think about why I'd done that, and I suppose it was removing myself uh, from from the story a bit. And when, when did you start writing the story? Was this uh, while you were in the army or afterwards? When I, when I was in, yeah, I was still in the army, but okay. I was sort of well on the way out. And then so the conclusion of sort of how to solve the problem of taking myself away is, I suddenly wrote this short story from the point of view of a tourniquet which is the opening to the book, it's the first chapter, and it tells the story of Tom Barnes being saved by this object. Um, and then I sort of wondered, well, can I do it again? So I started to write and wrote the IED, and there was something very interesting about writing that, because the, it brought, suddenly brought in the insurgents, um, which the story also talks about. So that was the reason, really. It was, it was a way of removing myself, but at the same time, when I started to do it, it did something for me which was very exciting. Mm -hmm. so, sort of creatively. But did it work also, one way or another, better for you to distance yourself in that way? I, I think that's, well, that's exactly why I was doing it. So it gave me that distance. Not only was I talking about fictional characters, but I had a certain distance. But is it, on one hand, it is distance, because it's they're, they're objects that have no personality. But on the other hand, they're objects that can be really close to the body, you know, like a catheter or or a bone saw, and so they can show an incident in the world of the book. 
in a really weird way, but quite exciting for me anyway as well. Right, the bone saw part is actually quite gruesome and very, very, you know, direct. Yeah. I mean, for some people they have the need to have a strong stomach. Why did you, you know, make it so brutal actually? Is I did a way to express your anger or was it No, no, else? no, I'm not angry, I'm not angry. Um, I did wake up in the morning and think, can I write something that will make... I mean, I always think, can I write something that will give people a physical feeling? Can I make someone gag? You know, can I make them... Why would you want to make someone gag? <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Because that's powerful, isn't it? I mean, it's a yeah. powerful thing to do, I think. Um, but also, in, in the UK, there's, there's, a, there's a reasonable amount of injured soldiers walking around and sometimes in the press, and they see these, this technology, and they see these men who, and women who have been um, injured, but they see sort of final product, they see these people walking around and they think these, that they're fine. Mm -hmm. And often it's not that easy. Work, certainly I work quite hard to, um, to make it look easy, but I also wanted to show that in the recovery there are some pretty brutal things that happen. So right. it's important that I got that reading the book, you go through the mill. You know, yeah. you get you you. I don't know that expression, but you, you you go through some of the hard times in order to get the redemption at the end. I right. How how you know how close to what you experienced is actually in the book uh, when you describe these recovery moments of recovery. It depends, really. I mean, things like the bone <coughs> saw, the operations. I was completely unconscious, luckily, yeah. um, so I had to recreate them. I more looked at it in terms of sort of themes of themes that I wanted to get across that I experienced, and then so there are some very autobiographical moments, mm -hmm. but I but they often don't happen how they happen in real life because the characters are different, right. or I wanted to make them more powerful or simpler to read. I mean, actually, being blown up is it does quite complicated things to the body, right? And and the book would be about four times longer if I you know really gone into some mm -hmm. of that, right? There is a part I recall when you're actually, um, Tom is getting home for the first time. Uh, his mom is there, his father, his brother, and he just, you know, breaks down and also um, tells actually that he has the feeling that he's on the, on the stage and everybody's watching. And <laughs> like now, but. Why do you describe, was that an autobiographical moment actually, and, and what do you mean by that? So that chapter is actually one of the most autobiographical mm -hmm. sections of the book, I mean it happened slightly differently. The reason that it happened there was, being in hospital was a very weird situation. The, I'd been in this conflict, Afghanistan, and then been blown up, and, and although I remember being blown up, suddenly I was unconscious, and then I was back in this hospital in the UK and I spent six weeks, six to eight weeks in, in, in the hospital and it's a very weird existence, you're on drugs and you're having, I had sort of 11 general anaesthetics and there's all these people coming to visit you and they all want a piece of you and they're, and they're all coming to, they're, I suppose they're all coming to show their love for you and but sometimes you just wanted them to go away, I mean you're just exhausted by all these people who were, because it was, diff it was tiring talking to them. And I suppose that's, and I didn't want to be there. I had no plan ever. I, th I think I, the last time I'd been in a proper hospital was when I was born. I mean, I'd, right. in that sense, you know, I, that was the part that felt like it was this big act, this big thing that I never wanted to have gone through. And then you go home and suddenly you, you're doing the good old British stiff upper lip and not showing any weakness in hospital. And then you're suddenly back where you used to have a normal life, and I suppose what's happened to you suddenly, you, you suddenly realise that actually your life's changed. Right. Was was your family actually important to you through the whole process? Yeah, I mean, the, so the, there was a doctor who said the two, for recovering from things like this, there was a doctor who said the two things that, that he thinks makes good recovery is diet. You know, apart from all the medical stuff, is it's diet. So don't smoke, but just eat well. Mm -hmm. And also loving family and right. close unit around you. Yeah. Because there were people who were you know, from sort of broken homes and had very complicated family issues going on. And I, my experience was much more sort of 
you know, I probably could have made it much more interesting. Right. But, but, but you know, that I, ha I suppose in the book there's there's the, the conflict is out there, and then the, the, alongside you have the sort of recovery, which is much more hopeful than I wanted to. Because a lot, you know, I, although I wanted to take people to the bottom and, and show how desperately crap war is, um, I also wanted to show some sort of something that was more uplifting. Mm -hmm. That was my experience. I thought it was interesting too. There's a part that actually, you know, has been uh, written from the perspective of the purse of the mom, right? Mm -hmm. And that purse also can describe the feelings that the mother has. So you get really close into what it means for a mother to experience something like that. The fear of, you know, entering a room, seeing your son like that for the first time. I thought that was really, you know, interesting that you could get that close to emotions of other people uh, in that way. Um, but I was wondering, did you actually talk a lot with your mom about it too? I mean. Although this happened to you, you must feel also bad for her almost, knowing mm -hmm. she's a mother and that she's hurting too. I was just wondering, how, how does that work? I mean, are you yeah. that stiff upper lip as well? Or yes. Just, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, I never spoke to my mother about it. No? Uh, no, not. Okay. I mean, they, my mother and father were actually found out in a very different way to what happened to the book. I suppose I did a much more sort of normal, what would be, you know, it's, she's at home and these the, the sort of what, what in the British Army they call notification officers from the regiment come to her door and she can see them through the glass. So, which is a much more normal way of it happening. They were on holiday, so they sort of got a phone call. But um, you're a writer, you can get into other people's heads. You just, you just engage your imagination and think, what would it be like right. if your son yep. was, was injured? The thing about the objects, the, the hand. But I mean, I'm, I'm just wondering, mm. was it easier for you to sort of imagine that by taking the purse of your mom yeah. as, you know, the one the describing way the hurt instead of, you know, the mother herself? Yes, maybe. And, and when I was sort of choosing the objects, I wanted objects that said something about what I was talking about in the book. So the mother's handbag was a you know, it was something that was felt personal to her, so it had this sort of, you know, I, I, it felt like the right thing to use in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I could also, there's a bit where the handbag gets left upstairs. Sorry, we're getting to people from Has anyone, who's read it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. Well, right, some people read it. Yeah. But it's, it's, there's a bit where I leave the handbag upstairs and mm -hmm. they can just hear the murmuring downstairs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, I really did that because I needed, I couldn't write that, my, you know, what is really my parents, but is also these fictional characters. Um, it was hard to write it, so I, it almost felt, it was another moment where using the inanimate object felt almost more powerful that, you know, I could, you could hear, you can hear them through the floorboards talking, but you can't really hear them. Right. So, so it, yeah. Yeah. There was another part in the same chapter, um, when you were coming home, that, um, first of all, you describe that Tom really feels like he's on the stage, everybody's, you know, looking at, him, looking at him and he's realizing suddenly my life turned out to be this way. But then pretty soon after that, he's already saying to his mother, I'm actually accepting this because I, I don't, I wouldn't want things to be different than they turned out to be. And is that autobiographical as well? Yes, it is, yeah. And it's really hard to explain why. Um, why, when something like this happens to you, why you can think, I, I'm, I would never change it. And obviously it's a ridiculous thing to say, because you, you, you cannot change it, but um, I, I truly believe that, it, it, that at the stage it happened to me, it felt like, you know, maybe there was a bit of bravado going on as well, but it felt like something that was very much a part of me. And now, I mean, I wouldn't be sitting here. Just have, you know, my life is mad now. It's just ridiculous. But Life's mad. Describe <laughs> it. <laughs> no, I, I was thinking. So I was thinking about this on the plane on the way over here because somebody had asked me, um, and maybe you actually asking why. You know, why is it that um, you can now? This is the best. In a way, this is the best thing that's happened to me. Why is it that something that's really like it's a huge damage psychologically and physically 
why does that suddenly become the defining moment in your life? And I'll, <laughs> blunt answer, when you're lying in Afghanistan, face down in the dirt, and you, you are convinced you're going to die, it's the loneliest thing ever, mm -hmm. I would have thought. I mean, I, it was just so lonely. So now, I think it's sort of the opposite of that. It's this, it's this, I, 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 the connections to all, I'm sorry, I'm getting a bit deep and meaningful here, mm -hmm. but it's the connections to all these people that I really savour in life, and that is why I'm like, this is just awesome mm -hmm. to be alive. So right. I think that's why. Sorry, I've gone on the road. So you're maybe more open to connect because you've experienced that extreme loneliness. But you also, you value slightly different, you value things differently, I mm -hmm. think, as well at the same time. And, that, and having a, a daughter who's five months old is also part of that as well. Right. You know, it, it, there's lots of things in life, and it happens to people in different ways, I'm sure. It's not, you don't have to go and step on a mine for this, don't worry. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Right. So, you have a daughter of five months who's keeping you out of wake. And quite awake, <laughs> yeah, okay. And no nightmares. Right. No. No, okay. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more because, I mean, of course, no one can imagine how it must be to step on a bomb and actually experience that. But can you describe it a little bit more for us? What that does to a person? Yeah, I can, I can. I think read the book a bit because yeah. those, I thought very carefully when I was writing those those passages that are about the aftermath of being blown up. And I really, you know, I dug deep to write those passages. And it is almost impossible to reimagine, actually, that the sort of pain and loneliness that I was describing. Um, in, 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 and the body, and it's probably similar to childbirth, in that you 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 never have another one, would you? No, <laughs> because it's so painful, but then you, sorry, I can't really see anyone. Um, but you never have another one because it's right. so painful, mm -hmm. but then your body forgets because it's, you know, there's probably you know, something clever going on right. in your head that means that you will have one. And, and I think with severe pain. <laughs> but I hope this is going to be the only bomb you ever yes. have on. Yes, well, okay. <laughs> yeah. um, That would be bad luck. Yeah. Um, uh, no, but seriously, so you forget the pain, but at the moment itself, is the pain directly there, or is what now is, sitting here? No, I mean when you stepped on the bomb, is is that pain instantly, or is it coming mm, out no, afterwards? Or? No, it's um, it's like falling off your bike really badly, mm -hmm. and um, you get that sort of buzzing pain, or being hit in the head in the nose. You know when you get punched. In the nose, punched in the nose. <laughs> Um, and it's like that, and I suppose your senses get completely overridden by um, shock. I suppose it's shock, mm -hmm. but then when you try and stand up and nothing works. I mean, I felt I felt like I'd been decapitated, and I right. think that's but that's that was my immediate. Yes. I thought well, I was just a head, which is a pretty disconcerting. Yeah, thing. Um, and you said you feel lonely at that moment, or you felt very lonely. Afterwards, during the recovery, no, at that moment, at that, at that moment, that, okay. that's the gritting, right. gritting the teeth moment, mm -hmm. lying, and lying, right. And and I, I mean, there's lots of stuff that I felt I couldn't see either. Mm -hmm. I don't remember being able to see. Like, apparently, that might that might be to blood loss. It might be another. So, I mean, I don't know. But it was very odd. You also said that um, the disorientation that you have when it happened is something you wanted to also, you know, express in the book. How did you do that? What did you... Yeah, so, um, I was, I was, yeah, I've always been interested in the sort of form of books and the way they're written, and I wanted the book to sort of be a mirror of what that experience is like. So I didn't want it to be so disorientating that you couldn't follow it, but I wanted to give the reader a sense of not... Because when you're in hospital, you, you've just come out of an operation or something, or there's people talking, but you're not sure what they're talking about. Or you don't know when you're going to be safe, or when you're going to get your next hit of morphine. Um, so that's quite disorientating. But then there's also being in combat and being, being in, just living in a patrol base in Afghanistan is quite odd in terms of knowing when you're going to be safe, where the enemy are. Um, 
So in the book, the, the, the narrative slightly jumps around, and some of the objects, you don't quite know what they are to start with. So there's a sense of trying to sort of un be, it being revealed to you as you read it, I suppose, is what I was going for. You know, sometimes it works. Right. But also, it's you could actually start with any chapter, and it would work. Yeah, right? don't do that. <laughs> but, but, but yes, that's, that's what you want to, yeah. to, to be. Um, well, well, I was, when you write a book, you're all on your own, sitting in the local library, and you're writing, and then you have lots of thoughts, and you discard some of them, and some of them you sort of suppress into the language, and you hope that no one's ever going to notice them, mm -hmm. and then you sit on the stage, right. and somebody notices stuff. Um, <laughs> And so, so I had thought about that. You had thought about the fact that right. maybe this could be a book. But, but I, you know. Okay, you prefer people to start on page one. Yeah, I'm, I'm, if anyone does it, can they let me know and see how it goes? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, um, when I edited it, I did read it in different orders actually to make to, to see how things worked. Right. So, yeah. um, the book is not only you know um, about um, Tom Barnes. It actually also involves an entirely different story, which uh, uh, there are two boys who are actually old friends, Latif and uh, Faridun, and um, they are good friends, they share a bike, they play um, a lot when they're young, but actually the war is, you know, making them go in different directions, so Latif is hooking up with Akhtar, who is actually uh, fighting the foreigners that invade his country. And then uh, Faridun is actually, you know, sort of like uh, the innocent boy uh, staying with his uh, father, working the land, and uh, they sort of also get confronted with one another to be on the opposite side during the war. Um, what I found really interesting is that, first of all, you chose not to make specific in what country this book is actually. Um, you know, the story is actually happening. It's neither Afghanistan, it's neither Iraq. Um, as a reader, you don't know. Why, why did you decide to do that? Um, well, it started... I mean, because yeah. easily this could be an anti-war book. You could be really precise, you know, you mm. could really criticize also. I think it is probably an anti-war book. But the, the, the reason I did it was a bit... They, I had to set myself rules. Um, and one of the very early rules was... It's got to be fiction. I'm, it's not about me, and I'm not going to mention a country, it's a particular country. And the reason was that I, I, although the book has lots of political, you know, there's lots of thought in there, I hope, and I have lots of views that I make, I didn't want to make a particular political point about a particular war, about Tony Blair or Karzai or anything like that. So why not? Um, because I wanted the book to be a piece of art, not a piece of. Um, it's not non-fiction. It's not. This isn't. I'm not critiquing. You know, it's, that's just. I'm not interested in that. There's long, big debates in the UK about whether the equipment we had was good enough. Mm -hmm. Things like that. And I'm, I'm just not interested in that. Because um, actually, the, I never would have written this book if it hadn't been a creative thing for me. Right. It just wouldn't exist. So that was the reason. That was the reason I put. Um, but I, at the same time, you do think it's an anti-war book. Well, any book about. Any thoughtful, unless you're, I don't know, you know, some of these gun ho books, any thoughtful mm -hmm. book about war is going to be anti war, I think. Mm -hmm. you know, even if you set out to write a you know, swashbuckling book about war and you really think about war, it's going to be, you know, I, my personal opinion is. But I did try, I do try and show some of the excitement and adrenaline and how, one, how amazing it is to be. Um, a group of young soldiers together in a, in a difficult environment. That's a really exciting thing. So I tried to get that in the book. Yeah, if there are basically pro-war books or movies, then mm. it's usually yeah. about this connection between the young soldiers. Yeah, it's, it's about the adrenaline. And, and yeah. But it's it's a bit, uh, those books I think of a bit like those first person shooter game, you know, the, the video <laughs> games. It's, yeah. it's a bit like that. Mm -hmm. um, and they're pretty mindless, those games. Right. Um, anyway. Um, anyway, but for you it was very clear you you know you wanted to write a non uh, a fiction book and so therefore 
much this was. Uh, yeah, and and by bringing in by bringing in Latif and Faradun, the other side, I had, and it came out of writing this. You know, when I thought, right, I'll write a chapter from the point of view of the IED, I thought, well, wow, it's going to have to be made by some people. And suddenly I had these characters. And the interesting thing is that when you're a soldier, um, insurgency is a really weird way of doing war because one day you can be helping an old lady at a market, and the next day you can be in a full blooded um, battle. Mm -hmm. And it could be, they could be on the same street. So it's a very odd type of warfare, it's very difficult as a soldier to get right. Um, and we learnt a lot before we deployed about um, the local... What kind of things did you learn before you actually... Yeah, so you learn about the, the tribal dynamics, the religion, what mm -hmm. people eat, the fact that you should pick up your cup of tea in a certain way, and you should take your shoes off, I mean you learn all this stuff. Right. But then you get deployed there, and you get deployed to a tiny little part of Afghanistan which is has its own very specific things going on. And, and, and you don't speak the language either, which makes things even harder. Um, but I suppose my point is that, that, that learning about the local population was a way, for me certainly, when I was a soldier, sort of humanised the people that were out there. But as soon as one of your soldiers gets killed, it's very easy to then dehumanise. Mm -hmm. Because war is so de dehumanising. Um, and as a tour goes on, did that actually happen also? Uh, yeah, I love him. Yeah, yeah. In, in Iraq and things. Yeah. And, you, and as an officer, I was an officer, there's, you have to really tread carefully because you're, you, you normally have 30 people who've trained hardened killers that you, and they are brilliant, and they're, but they, they need, they, they, you are essentially their safety catch. You have mm -hmm. to make sure that they only start being trained hardened killers when you ask, when the time is right. right. And 99% of the time, it's not the time to be. But as a tour goes on, there's a real danger that as people get hurt, they be, there's more, they feel more, uh, they feel the enemy is, is they sort of dehumanise the enemy. Right. Fast forward to writing a book, and if you're writing char thoughtful characters, it sort of rehumanised them. And I was never angry, and I never, but it was a really interesting thing to do, writing these, right. writing to the other side, because you sort of, and some of the themes that I wanted to get into the book that, were, that are as autobiographical as about Tom Barnes, who's the Indian soldiers, are things like why people go to war, why I join the army, and that's explained as much in mm -hmm. the insurgent side as it is in, in Tom Barnes' side. Did you do have the reaction after you were blown up to also have this dehumanizing view, or did that never happen to you? I just, no. I just, I pretty quickly thought, if you're going to be stupid enough to be a soldier, these things happen. Right. And I also thought, right, what next? You know, I was quite, and I think that's my family. And okay. the, you know, I was 23 when I joined the army, but I, and I was 26 when I was injured. And although that sounds very young, I had been to university, I travelled a bit, I got pissed quite a lot, I'd had fun. Okay. I had soldiers. Why did you join the army? Actually, what, what? did you have to, or did you decide? What do you mean I have to? Well, they, no, I chose to. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but my point was, that I had soldiers who who lost both legs, who were eighteen, mm -hmm. and I didn't really know what I did before I was eighteen. And so they, I think, being injured at that age is much more difficult. You know, having those sorts of, they just come out of school, they hadn't really even been in the army for very long, no. and I think that. That was much harder for them, but for me, I never felt angry about it. Really, it just okay. felt like. Why? Why did you choose to do it in the first place? Why did I choose to join the yeah. army? Because um, the pay is quite good. Um, the it's quite exciting. It's a bit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, it's leadership. I was interested in leadership a bit. I mean, lots of lots of reasons. Okay. About one percent queer country. 30, I mean, 39 okay. cents a pay, you know, I mean, there's lots of reasons. Many reasons. Yeah, many reasons, yeah. And, and only back, 1 percent was the queen. Yeah. But it's weird, <laughs> as you join the army, as, as time goes on, those percentages change slightly. Okay, so how did it change in the end? How I mean, maybe the queen grew to maybe 2 percent, really? maybe. <laughs> you get sort of all that sort of shining your kit and stuff. And okay. Yeah, I don't know. 
Stop anyway, uh, back to uh, Latif and Faridun. Yeah. You know, we get to get to know them pretty well as well. I was wondering, did you talk a lot to local people uh, in order to actually sort of get into, you know, those the minds of those two boys, or no, no. did you make up a lot, or did it come from stories from other soldiers? Oh, it's completely invented. I mean, yeah. I, it's, but my job actually, I mean, in Afghanistan, I wasn't a particular commander. I was a liaison officer, mm. basically, and I, my job was to try and was essentially to try and make the local population like us more than they like the Taliban, or like the government mm -hmm. of Afghanistan, I should say, more than mm -hmm. like the Taliban. That was my job. It was very difficult to yeah, do. Yeah, it there seems was, like a very difficult yeah. job. Yeah. Um, but it meant that I spent time talking to people, trying to work out what their motivations were. Mm -hmm. But when it came to reading the, sorry, writing the book, I didn't, I didn't, sort of, I didn't go and, I didn't, yeah, I didn't research it in that way. Yeah. Um, another question that's sort of, well, um, it's something we talked about before, but of course uh, everybody, you know, has been full with the news on Brussels recently, and also unfortunately people there have lost body parts, you know, people died, but also people are, you know, lying in hospitals now having a similar experience mm. to what you're going through. Um, is there something you know you can explain or, or say, well, not directly to those people, but mm. you know, what can you say about the fact, you know, that people have to live differently? Yeah. Uh, coming from your own experience. The thing that I've really realized being into like this is that it's very easy to think everyone is the same whether, I mean, we do this anyway, whether it's about injury or not. But I, um, the, the first thing is that everyone's different. So every injury is different, both psychologically and physically. And so when people see two amputees walking down the street, I think it's quite easy for us, and even I do this, you know, it's easy for one to say, well, this is their problem. Whereas actually it won't be. And there's soldiers that I know who look completely fine but they've got a tiny bit of nerve damage in their back, which gives them chronic pain all the time. And I never swap places with them. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that, and this is my experience, but in terms of these sorts of really desperately horrid physical injuries, there's never been a better time to have them because the equipment and the medical care is as good as it's ever been. Um, this this thing here costs £70,000 and it's, I plug in at night and it has a microprocessor and then it means that when I walk down that ramp it knows how it, how, um, what, the, what the slope is. Um, so it is, that in that sense, there's hope there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Is it also for you, I mean, I understood that um, you, you, before you liked to run, um, mm. do you still do that? Are you doing other sports? I kayak actually. Yeah. I see kayak. Because running is, I can run, I use the blades, but um, I was looking for a sport where I was as normal as I could be to everyone else, if that makes sense, because the running was still quite painful when I couldn't run as quickly. It was just a bit more frustrating. I couldn't go as far. I couldn't run over a mountain, which is what I used to do. So now I can do it in a boat. In the kayak, you take the legs off and you can be completely free, yeah. as I understood? Yeah. 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 Okay. And so what parts do you go? Scotland, Wales, Sweden. And then you're completely on your own in the boat. Yep. Yeah. 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 Bit of exposure. Yeah. 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 No longer dependent on anything else. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Actually, to get back to the political part of the yeah. terrorism, um, with your experience in Afghanistan and Iraq, I was wondering how do you look at a, a thing like the terrorist act in Brussels? Um, do you see all these things? connected and also how do you think we should deal with these things with these attacks because yeah. it's most likely that they're going to continue yeah i mean i could put i can trot out the party line which was and it still is our being in afghanistan meant that it gave us a platform with which to degrade al-qaeda in pakistan and if you read anything, that's happened. 
but obviously it's a lot more complicated than that. And Iraq is a different story. Um, I think there's lots, of, you know, the Arab Spring and things like that have made for a very volatile Middle East and North Africa. Um, and I'm not sure any of our anything that we've done or haven't done has really influenced that hugely. It hasn't helped, but. Um, I think what really saddens me is that when I got on the bus the morning after the Brussels attack and I got onto the bus in London and I looked at a chap, a bloke, standing there and to me he looked like somebody who could, I imagined he might be somebody who would be carrying a suicide bomb in his, in his days, in his uh, rucksack. And for a split second I gave him the one, you know, the look up and down. And I hate that because I pride myself on someone who feels that our society should be free and equal and mm -hmm. open. And, and that's the power of terrorism and I just hate it, you know, the fact that it makes me do that. Um, and so in that sense, you know, we should all, I think we should all understand that terrorism is going to have that effect on us. But I also think um, we, should hold, we should hold firm to the fact that of what is important about our society. So, in order to hold firm, what attitude should we have? Well, I just don't think we should jump too quickly to measures of security measures that take away people's freedoms. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's obviously a, um, a security operation that happens in the, it is ongoing all the time, and happens in the aftermath of something like this. And it needs to be quick, it needs to be efficient, it needs to be violent, if it needs, you know, sometimes in very very specific cases but it also needs to be balanced with a much more i mean it really worries me when i hear people saying we you know, europe is at war um i just think when we should learn our lessons from george bush saying that i mean like how that go. and i know it's politics and i know they're just words but you don't but think europe is at war no i don't think so i don't think so and, and i think um and i think even if it feels like we are in 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 the sort of short term we should really hold on to the fact that short-term risk, now this is, you know, sorry, we've got price <laughs> off the book, but short-term we'll yeah. short risk um, in terms of accepting that it's worth having open societies, and that may mean that some people might, might die. Mm -hmm. But in the long term, that's the only way that we defeat this. You know, we need, to, it's a strategic view of these things, and I just think of Northern Ireland. You know where we made some pretty rubbish right. um, decisions in the seventies, like in turn, where we round, round, rounded up a lot of people. And you know you can never tell, but there's studies that show that probably it made those. There were a number of things. I think five techniques, which are sort of a torture technique, in turn, and um, they, they may these may have lengthened the war mm -hmm. by thirty. You know by thirty odd years. Right. Um, so you just, I just think you know. If you go and intern a, com a community uh, of people, you are asking for trouble. Right. But also, our attitude needs to be kind of stoic towards the fact that. That's my you know, personal yeah, opinion, yeah. yeah. In, because, because in the long run, it means that. You know, that stoicism in the long run is the only way that we're going to win any sort of debate of narratives that actually mm -hmm. what they're doing is desperately wrong. And although our societies are our own view, they. That, that we uphold them as being free and open. Right. Um, Sorry. No, I think it's, you know, it should be part of the, the whole discussion of the evening. There's something else I'm um, actually I want um, to read a little part of the book, but we have the Dutch version and we have the English version. Um, who prefers English? Shall we do it in English and not in Dutch? Okay, then it's up to Harry to read a part. <laughs> so maybe you can explain um, what part you're going to read. So, um, Roseanne chose this chapter. Um, I told them actually. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the 28th chapter, so it's the 28th object in the book. And um, it describes a moment where Tom Barnes, the main character, has sort of he's been through that initial medical um, recovery in hospital. He's had the sort of first um, surgery, and he's now at the rehabilitation centre. So he's he's starting to get better. He's no longer getting worse, 
and um, he's starting to get his prosthetic legs. <coughs> I was screwed to the wall by workmen in a new disabled toilet at a rehabilitation centre that needed more capacity. I reflected the handrails, basin, dryer and shiny toilet. I think it should be a tiny slower, I think, for the... Yeah, sorry. <laughs> a, a red panic cord hung down from the ceiling. Many of them came in, often on crutches or in wheelchairs, and I reflected them as they awkwardly pulled the door shut. They held the rails, flushed, and used the sink. Some didn't need to sit on the toilet and emptied urine out of a tube. A new man appeared. At the start, a nurse came with him and helped wipe, but after a few weeks, he had the strength to do it on his own. Now he was back, and he pulled himself from the chair onto the toilet seat. His stumps jutted out in front of him. He wore a t-shirt and shorts and looked down between his stumps as he went. Once he had finished, he flushed, and then he wheeled up to the door. But this time he caught his reflection in me and stopped. What I showed was different from how he imagined himself. He saw the freakish, freakishly short limbs and the space between them and the floor where he used to exist. He knew I reflected what others saw, and it shocked him. He shook his head in disbelief. He was unnatural, created by violence and saved by soldiers and medics. He'd survived the unsurvivable, and it showed. He felt disgusted. He pulled his shorts off and then his t-shirt and dropped them onto the floor. Naked, he stared at me and down at himself and the shop and, and shook his head again without wanting to. He saw the grotesque scars and folds of flesh and the pink skin grafts that covered his wounds. He saw the violence of the bomb. Who could love that, he thought. Then he closed his eyes and started. It hurt, but less than everything else, and his expression didn't change, and there was no pleasure. When he'd finished, his severed nerves buzzed, and he bent down. He bent his head down and breathed. His semen was brown with blood and from trauma, and he looked at it in surprise. He went to the tissue dispenser, flushed again, put his clothes on, and left. He never looked at me again. There's, there's much happier bits in the book, <laughs> <laughs> and it's shocking. But Roseanne said I should read that. No, I, I thought, you know, it, it shows how intimate it can be. Um, and I thought that was very interesting because, you know, maybe initially you would think an object, how, how intimate can an object describe something. But it actually works really well, I think. I was just wondering, are there more books written uh, from the point of view of objects? When I started to write this, I was really badly read, um, which I think helped, and I didn't, I sort of didn't know where it sat. Um, I knew it was slightly unusual, but to do it like this, and it's only since I've been giving it to people, you know, since it, since you, when you give it to people to start reading that people say, "Oh, have you read this? Or have you read that?" Um, so it turns out the first ever English poem, Anglo-Saxon, about 400 A.D. It's called The Rood of the True Cross, and it's, it's a poem written about the cross that Christ was crucified on. And some of it is written from the perspective of the cross. Okay. So there's nothing new. Um, <laughs> and so you're just going into a very, very old tradition, yes. basically. Yeah. But, it's, but it's pretty unusual. And then the Victorians got into it um, in, in the sort of around the time of Dickens. Um, and there's, there's, there are stories told from the point of view of a penny coin, and it, they're about transactional social things. So it goes from the rich to the poor. Uh, and, and then there's some sort of quite experimental stuff in the 90s. There's a book written from the point of view of a, a, a very, very old Egyptian um, pot that gets bought in London at auction and then sits in this house in Mayfair and watches all the sort of sexual encounters going on, pretty weird. Okay. So it has, you know, it, it's, um, but, but, but the difference is a lot of those objects, they, it's often they have character or they actually speak um, to tell the story. And, and although there's some, um, I tried to stay away from the objects having too much character. For me, they were sort of points, points of, experience so you know this glass can't think for itself but it has a certain view of the world but that view is, a, is not just visual in the book it's sort of it can it, 
Yeah, anyway. It's yeah, really sure. Easy. But there's one interesting part that some objects are capable of reading the minds of people. So you must have made a decision about that. That, you know, uh, for example, the bag can actually, the purse can read the thoughts of the mother. Yes, so. yeah, it can. And I thought really hard about whether that would work or not. And I think for some readers, it might, there might be a moment of, well, this is ridiculous. <laughs> um, and of course, the whole book is ridiculous. But um, No, it's not. <laughs> but, but um, yeah, it was just a dis I, I, I tried it without it, and it became very sort of, uh, it became very sort of abstract and quite fabulistic. Whereas I could just say more. Right. So, but I just set myself rules. So the, the objects that are being touched by a, a character, the ones that the objects know, if they're a sort of personal object, then they know the feelings. But yeah. so, you know, like the catheter, for instance, knows what he's thinking. But right. some of the other ones, like, no, right. it doesn't. I suppose it does, actually. Anyway. Yeah. Okay, so you had your own personal rules. Uh, Which obviously yeah. fail. Right. <laughs> actually, because. Um, we have 10 minutes left. Uh, I'd like people in the audience, if they have a question, they can they can ask it right now. So, please. Hello. Hi. Hello. Uh, in the book, there's one or two passages passages in which you, the main character. Um, Thinks that it would be would have been better if he wasn't saved. Why didn't they let me die there? Have you ever experienced that moment during recovery? Um, yeah, yes, I have. Yeah, and and so there's so there's that bit where he you know he says that he you know he it's a good thing that's happened to him and it's positive. But there have been moments, and they're normally around pain actually when I when it when the pain has been unbearable um, unbearable and. It's only happened a couple of times, but it was sort of, it was that sort of pain that took me, the, it was that loneliness, I think, again, you know, it was being lonely and being alone, and it was the pain that was doing that. And there was one time in hospital, which is, so it happened, yeah, it happens in the book, really, um, slightly differently, but, you know, he's, he sort of, he feels very alone, and that was, um, yeah, so yes, yeah. Yes, it's in the order I wrote it, but there's two objects that didn't make the cut. Um, and the objects that didn't make the cut are, were very early, actually. They were the very first few chapters. One was a detonator, and the other was ketamine, the drug. And it just had two, it was just, it was a bit of fear and loathing in that movie, in the last video, so it was quite mad. So that didn't make it. Um, one of them was cut by this one, the other one not cut. Um, and the ob choosing the objects, was that the next? Uh, it came quite instinctively actually. Normally I would, um, I'd sort of, again it goes back to this theme, so there's a chapter where some of the characters sit down to talk about the local culture and, you know, I, and it became, to me, I thought we're only an object which can sort of embody culture and so that chapter is narrated by a Persian rug and beginning of the chapter there, the rug is sort of knotted together, and it's really interesting the way that sort of all the we, all that sort of in being banged down with these knots held together, and then it gets transported across the country, and they sit on it and talk about the culture, so so in that sense, yeah, the, that's how I sort of chose them. Um, and there were some things that ne I needed to drive the story forward with, so there's a drone, it's one of the, is one of the, um, one of the objects, and I wanted to, because it really annoyed me when everyone said uh, IEDs is such a um, shitty way to fight, it's so unfair, and I just thought, well, flying a drone, you know, a drone is not fair either, just fly, you're just lying in your bed at night and a bomb comes through, through the ceiling. So I wanted to show that sort of, um, the, the balance of that, so, that so, so in some senses I had to think about what could show what I wanted to say. 
Anyone else? Um, a couple of times, three times, sorry, I think you said, I'm not angry, or I wasn't yeah. angry. Yeah. And I, I find that really, find that surprising. Yeah, I suppose I probably said it too much. <laughs> it doesn't protest too much. Yeah. It's because people sort of assume you are. But, sorry. But, so it makes me think that you you didn't write your book out of like need or therapy, and um, and so and you said it's a creative process, and I think it's a work of art. And how long did you give yourself to write this? And and what was your experience? Because like, did you study that at uni or? Yeah, so I um before I joined the army, I did I went to art school. So I was I painted and I drew and made sculpture, uh, and then I studied history of art for a while. And then I joined the army and then I did a masters in fine art. But I was writing and I I I never felt like those particularly different things in terms of your I was you know there's a sort of creative problem and you're coming up with a solution to it. So in that sense. Um, you know, what's the, so in that sense, it was. It felt very. It felt like a creative thing to do. What was it? I can't remember. Oh, how long? Like, so I wrote ten thousand words of it about, which is you know, uh, ten chapters or something, five chapters. And then I was working. I had a job, so I would sit at my desk and think about the book, and I'd go to bed thinking about the book. But I didn't really have any time to to actually work on it. But in my mind, I was starting to pull the idea of could I do this thing with objects and you know, sort of really testing out whether it worked or not, because I knew that it was pretty weird. And then I sat down after about a year of thinking about it, quit my job, and I wrote it in 12 weeks. But, it, that, but it, that's a year in 12 weeks. But it's, I didn't just, you know, it, um, so, you, so yeah, but I, I knew where I was going when I sat down. Maybe one last question, anyone? Oh, yeah, and the therapy. Um, you, okay, you, no, is it, go on. Your book, how your book you're writing? Therapy or quite hard work? I mean, it's quite, I think. Therapy or hard work? Well, for you, I mean, you said it's taking you four years. I mean, yeah. I just think people, writing and art, is, for me, I don't think they're, they're therapy. They're a hard thing to put yourself through. If, right. you, if you're doing, I mean, something like drawing, I mean, doing a sketch or something, is not therapy. What is what? It's the. This is all my personal opinion, but it's about concentration. If you concentrate on something, whether it's a crossword or doing a math problem, that is that is a good thing for the brain. It's about concentration. It's not about therapy for me. And so, I really annoy you when people think writing mm -hmm. a book. I mean, it's a nightmare. It's just <laughs> it's forever and it's hard work. Anyway, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Last question. Are you writing already a, a next book, or was it just a one a, a one time experience? I mean, now you wrote your injury, and what about the subject of your next book? I mean, are you a writer or a <laughs> soldier who wrote about his war experience? Good question. Yeah. Good question. And I, you know, I I hope that there's enough that's not me in this. You know, that means that I I'm trying. I'm writing another book and. Give me a few years, and then we'll see if I'm a soldier who wrote a book or I managed to write another book. <laughs> anyway, for you now. Already a subject on your yes, book. yes, and it's, it's not. Uh, okay. it's, um, <laughs> he, he told me that he didn't want to talk no, about it's so, what's so, in there. <laughs> there's no soldiers, and there's no inanimate objects point of view. <laughs> it's a bit more. There's other stuff going on. Okay, but you don't want to talk about it, right? You said. It's about security in London, and it's um, it's about cowardice, really. So. Okay. But for now, I have to say, um, if you don't have the book, please do buy it, because it's, you know, um, in the back, and you're going to be signing it. Yeah, sure. There's an English version and a wonderful Dutch version with a translation by uh, Paul van der Leck, which is very nice. Paul is here also tonight. Um, and well, please enjoy. Um, maybe people can even ask you more questions yeah, sure. off stage. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.